You see, Satan had lied and tricked Adam and Eve into sinning. And it caused them to be cast out of the Garden of Eden and all of humanity to be, to be separated from God and condemned to hell. Then God confronted Satan and told him that one of Eve's offspring would one day restore his people and that he, Satan, would be cast into a lake of fire. That's in Genesis 3, verses 15, verse 15. Now, God loved mankind, so he sent his prophets to tell them that he would send a savior, the Messiah, or anointed one. And the Messiah arrived, but he arrived in the form of a baby, and his name was Jesus. Well, God is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus had been given an assignment. He was sent by God to save the world from their sins, and Jesus obeyed. He healed the sick. He cast out demons and condemned the false leaders of his people. He gave his life for the sins of all mankind so that all who would believe in him could have eternal life. Now, historical records abound, attend, uh, you know, attesting to the life of Jesus. His life and death are considered to be probably one of the more proven uh, aspects of uh, historical figures. Shortly before his arrest, Jesus offered a very special prayer. Oftentimes, they refer to it as the great intercessory prayer. First, he prayed for himself that the Father would receive him back into heaven and restore the glory that he had before this world began. Then he prayed for the disciples that the Father would protect, guide, and be with them as they delivered his message. Then he prayed for all Christians. That's us sitting here right now. He prayed for each child of God to have the same unity as exists between he and the Father. A unity which allows for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and oneness with God. Well, later, Jesus was hung on a cross until he was dead. And near the point of death, he said with a loud voice, it is finished. Upon his death, heaven and earth were shaken with violent earthquakes, and the earth was covered with darkness. People who had previously died were seen walking around, and the veil was torn from top to bottom in the temple. Can you imagine being the guy working in the temple and seeing that happen? Hmm. Anyway, the torn veil was to signify that the Spirit of God would no longer be in the ark, that had been kept at the back of the temple as the most holy of holies under the old covenant. Under the new covenant, the spirit is placed in every born again believer. The followers, followers of Jesus are now his tabernacle, the church. Jesus had completed the mission given him by his father and in so doing had opened the kingdom of heaven in all who would receive him. He was the new Passover lamb. Never again would there be a need for animal sacrifices. The lamb of God had shed his blood once and for all. Now Mary had gotten up early to visit the grave of Jesus, but to her surprise, the body of Jesus was missing. She didn't have the scriptures to look back on and read about this. She was a first hand, you know, a first responder, you might say. So anyway, in his place were angels, real angels. And they said to her, he's not here. He has risen. Surely the words of the angels at that empty tomb, he's not here. He has risen are among the most important words ever spoken. Jesus had paid it all. His life, his death, his burial, and resurrection ushered in a new plan of salvation for hum humankind. And the better and more perfect way was God's new covenant with his people. Salvation and eternal life 
were now available for anyone who would believe and accept Jesus as their Savior. Every time we take the bread and drink the wine of the new covenant, we are proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, and the Savior of the world. We're not separated anymore. We don't have to be separated from God. Nicodemus was a scholar and Bible teacher, but he didn't understand. He'd never heard that the Holy Spirit of God would enter into people. He couldn't understand what it meant to be born again. And he asked Jesus, how is that possible? You know, the act of God indwelling in man separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. The chief priests and the Pharisees had tried to stop the inevitable, but neither Roman soldiers, government seals, large stones, nothing could prevent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords from accomplishing his mission. So Jesus is the true message of Easter. And because of him, mankind can have a relationship with their creator and be with him for eternity. Easter brings new hope, new beginnings, eternal life, made possible by the one who loved us enough to die in our place, Jesus Christ. For much of the world, Easter is a tradition celebrated by colored Easter eggs, Easter bunnies. I eat the ears first on the chocolate ones myself, but anyway. To the followers of Christ, the true message of Easter proclaims the greatest act of love known to man. God's infinite love for mankind is the true message of Easter, a love that will continue into eternity. Good morning again, brethren, everyone. As you can see, the next message is titled, The Substance of Our Faith. And I'll be, uh, the passage that I'll be using is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 12. You know, the, this letter, the author of this letter, used to be one of the fiercest uh, enemies of Christianity until he encountered the risen Christ. And he became the most prolific writer of the New Testament. Talk about the power of the resurrection. And the reason I chose this letter is, is because it's, it's interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, you know, this letter was written somewhere around 20 years after the resurrection. It's just like, you know, we bought our house 20 years ago. And, you know, it's like, we read it here in verse 12, it says, but it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. How, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? It's like somebody telling me, you know, that I bought my house 20 years ago and now I actually didn't buy my house. It's that, you know, amazing. Only in 15 years, there was somebody already uh, teaching some false teaching that there's no resurrection of the dead. Now, fast forward 2,000 years to our time. What's the narrative out there? Jesus Christ did not resurrect. In fact, Jesus Christ never existed, right? What? A change that had happened. Verse 13, Paul continues. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13, he said, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. In verse 14, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. 
verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or useless or worthless. You are still in your sins. Wow. You know, there are many faiths out there. There are so many faiths out there. And in those faiths, the disciples of those faiths look up to the teachings of their spiritual leader. And they strive to live by those teachings so that they would become better people. So that in their hope, one day they will receive some happy reward. Now, do you realize that when, when Paul said this statement, that Jesus Christ also left a set of teachings to his disciples? Now, what Paul is basically saying is, you know, if you take the teachings of Jesus Christ, and in your own efforts try to obey them to make you a better person, what is, Christ, what is Paul saying? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You see, our faith is so much different from all the other faiths out there. Because in our faith, we look to a risen Christ, not only the teachings. We look to a risen Christ, and because he rose from the dead, he is now able to form and shape and transform our characters by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can live out his teachings. That is the main difference. The others, they, they just look to teachings to make themselves good. For us, it's the power of the risen Christ that transform us so that we will be able to live out his teachings. What a difference. Oh, but wait. It doesn't end there. Because he did this to all of us, his disciples, on the appointed time, God the Father will transform all his disciples in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, all of his disciples will be resurrected. And all these existence, this flesh that's subject to decay and pain, frustrations, will all be changed. And we will all be in glorified form, just like the risen Christ. You see, the importance of the resurrection, the importance of our faith. Our faith is different because it has real substance. And the substance of our faith is the risen Lord, King of Kings, and the only hope for anyone that will believe in Him. Amen? Amen. Amen.